Hi, and welcome to Apache NiFi 101. No more spaghetti flows. I'm Timothy Spann, developer advocate at Stream Native. And uh, my background is in streaming programming, things like Pulsar, Flink, NiFi, Spark, uh, IoT, different technologies. You know, but you'll see today, we're gonna cover one part of what's known as the flip or flip and stack, which is a combination of several open source softwares, Apache Flink, Apache Pulsar, the connection between Flink and Pulsar and Apache NiFi. All these are great ways to do streaming, but today we're gonna focus on Apache NiFi, which is uh, a way you can grab data from things like Pulsar, connect data to Flink. And uh, it's just one thing that you can uh, use to connect to something like Stream Native, which lets you get your data from wherever it needs to be to any other place in real time in any cloud. These are things you need to do. Today, you know, we're gonna show you how to do that with different types of data. Now, there's a lot of different types of data out there. Obviously, you've uh, experienced using a database, maybe use MongoDB or other NoSQL stores, you know, maybe big data on Hadoop, maybe different cloud resources, maybe you have JSON or XML files, text files, but a ton of different files, whether in logs, devices, coming off of applications. You have a lot of data and you're working with it different ways. One of the best ways to do that, and we'll show you that today, is using an open source project called Apache NiFi. It lets you either read or have pushed to all kinds of different data. And we'll show you some of the data in the demo. It's very easy to do. Very typically, once I have this data in a format that's clean enough, you know, you got rid of the nulls, maybe I enhanced the data, enriched it with other sources. I'll push it to something like Pulsar so that it can be shared to other, you know, data stores, other applications, other consumers, or something like Flink, where I could do real-time analytics on that SQL. What's great about this is it doesn't matter what type of data, doesn't matter when I run it, doesn't matter where I run it. I can run it on a laptop, I can run it on an on-premise data store, I could run it in any of the clouds use it with any type of data, any protocol, makes it very straightforward to do what, you know, used to be really complex, difficult programming. Now it's really straightforward and almost easy. And this is pretty much the standard flow if you're gonna build an application, you know, whether it's ETL, ELT, a streaming application, this is really the flow and it doesn't get much easier than this four-step process. You pick a data source, it could be a Pulsar uh, topic, it could be a relational database, it could be a file, REST endpoint, you know, anything from any of the cloud resources, NoSQL store, JMS, you know, all these different message queues and networks. So you'll get these data sources easiest to start with one. I grab, say, a file from a file system, then I'm gonna validate it, do any kind of conversions, enrichment, check against schemas, get it in a format that's you know, ready to transport. Uh, and then sometimes I'll aggregate that or maybe drop some of the fields out. You know, That's kind of an optional step, then get it somewhere. Often it's not the final destination, could be into another Pulsar topic cleaned up, could be in the final database, S3, wherever it needs to be. And that could be multiple places. I might have one source go to 20 sinks or 20 sources go to one sink. Any combination thereof, but we think of it in a simple flow as the data flows through the system, you know, from point to point. And even if that's spanning multiple clouds, even if it's petabytes of data, it's easy to run. What's nice under the covers, the architecture is pretty straightforward, but it's exactly what you need if you're building a clustered streaming system. You have a server, you have at least one in any kind of production environment, you know, you're gonna have three, five clustered applications. 
Now I find that the covers is a Java application presents itself with a web server. Uh, it has uh, different Java processes to control all those little controls on the screen. And it keeps uh, a cache of files in a couple different repositories based on their uses. You know, one is for the raw data. One is for the valuable content in there in whatever format it's in now. And another is a provenance repository for all the lineage, everything you've done to it. So you've got that record of everything you've done. And then we have Zookeeper to make sure the cluster is running properly, things are coordinated, messages are distributed evenly. And if you need something to run on only one node, we run it with the primary, very easy to do. Everything is shown to you in the UI, as well as through a command line interface and REST endpoints. I, I mentioned a little of the things there. One important thing to think about is a flow file. This is whatever is coming into the system. This could be one line from a log file. It could be a whole zip file. It could be one record from a database, a thousand records from a database. So we have this flow file of your actual data, which if you don't want to change it, you don't have to. And then metadata around it we call attributes. You can add and change these at will without affecting that data in case you have requirements there that you don't touch the data. Now it's pretty straightforward, but because of its flexibility, people can do things that make applications processing slow, difficult, or say, hey, I don't want to use NiFi. It's not doing things I, I don't expect. It's running too slow. I call them spaghetti flows. You don't want to do them. There's a lot of different things that you shouldn't do that I've seen. Uh, don't put a thousand different applications in one workspace on one small server. You are not going to be happy. Don't have too many steps. If it takes hundreds of steps to do something, maybe you should move it to another system. Maybe NiFi you should just do the pre-processing. Maybe it should be partially handled elsewhere. Maybe it should be a Flink app. Maybe it should be a Pulsar function. Too many steps, something might be wrong. Try not to execute third-party executables or scripts or Python. If it needs to be run in those, maybe you should connect that through Pulsar functions or through some other means. Executing things has got a lot of overhead. You know, you're running a full process. That's heavyweight. Make sure you use code that you understand. If you found it on the internet, it's not documented, it might not work. Make sure you get official ones or ones from me. I have really good processors if you need them. Uh, make sure you upgrade. It's pretty common sense, but if you're running old code, it might run slow, might not have all the best features. Don't do it. Make sure you have enough RAM. By default, they only give you half a gig. That can't do much. Make sure you're, put this on a 32 gig machine, use 16 of them, you know, use as much RAM as you can get, as many cores as you can. You know, if I have 16 or 32 cores, 32, 64 gig of RAM, I can process you know, a million records, it's great. Uh, try not to do things that you wouldn't want to do in a little file. Like you have a million record uh, file, you think you could process that all at once? Well, that might all have to go into RAM. So think about it. But if you do split things, splitting can be painful because now, you know, instead of running one activity, you're running as many as you split into. So if it was one item, you split it into a thousand sub items. Now I'm processing a thousand things, which may be good, maybe not, something to think about. But there are things you can do to get rid of these spaghetti, get things running better, reduce things, use less. You know, it's like in the real world, try to recycle, reuse components, use parameters so you can reuse things, make reusable chunks, Write a custom processor in Java if you're doing something that would take 20 steps. It'll be faster in one place. And then, you know, custom Java code. Or if you already have a library, reuse it. Make sure you use the documents. There's a ton of documents to tell you what to do, a ton of articles I've written. Go with the, the best practices. If you have data that looks like it came out of a table, you know, CSV, Avro, JSON, XML, use the record processors. They're faster. They have, they're easy to work with. 
There's no downside to using them. Please use the record processors. It'll save you headaches, save you memory, RAM, much faster, go that way. Use version control, things crash, maybe you lose your code, you don't want that. You know, make sure you always check in your things to version control and have that registry backed up. Use DevOps in the command line, make sure before you move to different servers, makes it easy and automatable. You want things repeatable, documented, and automated. Now, when you're running stuff in production, make sure that you keep things isolated. A dedicated server for your NiFi nodes in the cluster and dedicated nodes for Zookeeper will give you the best performance possible. Uh, I would say uh, if you need to, make sure you, if you're connecting to a database, you get the approved driver, the approved version, the latest one, ones that are tested, ones that work with your version of Java. Now, if I can run in 1.8 and 1.11, I recommend 1.11. Use a good solid JVM with all the bug patches. Don't do things that you wouldn't do for any other application. Now, the next part of our system, I said we often push it to Pulsar. It's a great way to make sure you never lose data. I get it into uh, a message queue. Other people can work on the data. It's never lost. Get it into Pulsar. Pulsar will geo-replicate. Let me run functions in case I need to move some of those apps. Horizontally scales, has tiered storage, all the DevOps tools you need, and support for multiple protocols. Maybe you don't want to use native Pulsar. Maybe you have MQTT. Maybe you have Kafka, JMS. Pulsar will act as if it was one of the brokers in that type of messaging system. So then you have that flexibility that it doesn't matter. It gives you a strength that you won't find elsewhere. But I've talked about it. I've gone through some of the definitions and the terms so you have an idea what's going on. But I think the only way for you to really understand this is to see a full demo. So let's go into the demo and then we could see you know, what exactly I was talking about and doing in the real world. First, once you log in, you'll start off with a blank canvas. I have a number of applications here. Uh, all these separate little applications are process groups. If you right click on it, you can see a lot of options. I can configure it, give it a name. Connected to parameters, we talked about parameters, very important. Let's you uh, reuse values, isolate them from your code. You'd also do things like set uh, back pressure for the entire uh, subset of uh, technology in there. You could also set different controllers or connection pools here. You could see which ones you could start them, stop them, add new ones. Pretty straightforward. Then you put in your parameters. These will all be available for everything inside that. And I could do something like stop them all. You could see what you can do here. Disable it. If you're not going to use it, stop it and disable it. Uses zero resources. Great tip for you. Uh, if you have some data waiting in a queue and you want to get rid of it, just empty all the queues. You could do that from the top. You could see what's going on from the top if anything's happened in the last five minutes. Good way to see what's going on. Now, if there's any kind of bugs, they'll show up in this little corner here. If you go to the hamburger menu, you could see that on your bulletin board. This is where any errors or warnings will show up. These are also available from the command line tool or the REST API. If you see in that hamburger menu, we also have other things like which version of 9.5 with the about. Summary tells you everything going on. This is a great way to know, you know what's running, what's stopped. Uh, what might have uh, you know a lot of writes going on? Is there anything sitting in a queue going in or out of NiFi? Uh, any connections you might have that uh, have a lot of data in them? Here you can see we've got uh, some sitting in here in one of these processes. And I can go right there with the arrow. Very easy to navigate. And I can, again, right-click anywhere gives you what you can do where you are. Like here, I could download this whole uh, set of source code. Could stop things. You get the idea. If I right click something here, I can't change it because it's running to uh, 
change something, I have to stop it. For a Q, I have to stop both sides. And here there's a couple options here. I could take a look and see what this data is. This is part of uh, a book. And you could see some different uh, text there. That's Providence. Let's me see what's going on. I could also change this Q. Uh, if you're going to be using it for things, you might want to name it so you could uniquely identify it and be able to find it in any kind of reporting. Here I could set a load balance strategy if I have multiple nodes. Round robin's a good one. I can compress it if it needs to move things around. I could set priority. So in case there's two different kinds of data coming in, maybe the data that's always loaded and an alert, I could prioritize that with an attribute. Pretty easy. So I stopped it. You can see data's backing up. I can see what I've processed recently and the date, what's happened. It said it changed some attributes. I could see which one's changed. And it's these that set uh, a content type. I can look at the old content, new content, and I can go right where I need to be there. I can see what this changes. Let's just check changing a content type. Not a big deal. You know, it depends on things I need to change within NiFi. This one is an interesting one because this is one of the record readers. So I could pick which kind of uh, reader it is. And I could do that dynamically with the reader lookup. So if I don't know what the data is, but I can infer it, I could do that. Since this is the one for queries, I can uh, write any number of queries here, looking at any of the fields, output it to something else, use a limited set of fields. As you see, when something stopped, it just uh, queues up for you. And here it's queuing up this into Apache Solar, just to give you an idea. Very easy in NiFi to navigate here down the bottom or to search for something. If I'm looking for, uh, you know, everywhere I use the word Pulsar, I could see where it is and jump right there. Very helpful. I say, oh, this one's not started. I got to set the controller. Very easy. Well, I hope you enjoyed the demo. I think it's mentioned everything that I talked about and it really solves those issues that we had when we talked in the beginning. You saw how easy it is to use NiFi. There's more things that you'll need to do. I've linked all the articles to get you started, the best content out there, best practices, demos, examples. Everything is ready for you. So just uh, connect with me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, if you have any more questions. Enjoy the rest of the talks here. It was an amazing conference. Thank you for coming to my talk. And uh, if you want some free stuff, I got some free books that you could uh, download. So click away. Thank you.